The Xu Chang Saga by user Hume Reddit Part 2 of Monkeys Reaches Stars Shu! Shu! She couldn't pronounce the human's name correctly. Her short muzzle just didn't want to make the proper sound. But Shu had always known when she was being addressed. She didn't respond now. The alien was staring down at her open hands, hairless but spotted with the greenish blood of the locale. Ima hadn't seen the first brute die, but she'd been hypnotized along with everyone else as the second met his end even as he'd tried to escape. Shu had crossed the room in an eye blink and shoved him into the nutrient sphere dispenser, leaping high and following it up with another hit from her leg. The impact had crushed him against the dispenser, crumpling it and spilling a stream of round nutrient spheres across the floor. Ima had been terrified and infuriated at the same time, terrified because this alien, this human who'd she'd allowed to play with the cubs for ten days, had crushed two of the cruelest mercenaries available for hire, as if they were nothing. Infuriated because this alien could crush these mercenaries as if they were nothing, and yet she'd cowered along with the rest of them for ten days as Gowans were plucked from their cage for experimentation and death. Then Ima saw Shu's face, and recognized the horror there. She's never killed before. She didn't know she could do this. Of course. An uncontacted species. It made Ima feel better and worse at the same time. Shu, she said again, carefully taking hold of the alien's hand, making sure her small claws were retracted before she did. Shu flinched, jerking out of her grip, and Ima forced herself to take hold again, not thinking of what those hands could do. Shu, we have to go. Shu just stared blankly. Ima reluctantly let go, turning to the others to help calm the cubs and get those who were still feeling the effects of the pain sticks to their feet. The door was still open. This was their one opportunity, and they couldn't waste it. They owed Shu, but they couldn't make her move nor spend time convincing her. There was always the chance the door could be operated remotely. With that in mind, she hustled everyone out the door to gather themselves safely out of their cell. Ima had barely made it out herself when the door began to slide down, either commanded by remote or activated by a timer. Shoo! She made a mournful sound. The door was three-quarters closed, just above a gowan's low hips, when clawless digits grabbed hold of it from underneath. Ima heard the motors inside the walls groan as they struggled against the obstructing force. The door still moved, but barely. The whine climbed in pitch for several heartbeats until Shu ducked under and let it go. The human met Ima's gaze. She shivered as if cold, the thick coat she'd been captured with and used as a pillow while she slept left behind, but her eyes were clear. Good, Ima said. She turned away, sniffing at the air, using her nose to try and choose a direction. But she was reasonably certain they were on a planet, and an open window was the best she was hoping for. Picking a direction, she moved forward with a confidence she didn't really feel. This way! Ima was the eldest female, so the others looked to her for leadership but she wished it hadn't fallen upon her. She had no idea what she was doing, not that she'd admit that to the others. So she led them and hoped for the best. They got lucky in that they didn't meet any resistance within the prison wing. Soon they found themselves in among what was obviously a lab complex. The walls were high and white, coated in polymers that helped them resist damage, bacteria, and blood stains. Ima thought grimly. Opening the odd door revealed the labs themselves and their corti occupants, confirming for Ima the nature of their kidnappers. One particular lab contained a Cortai scientist that Yulna recognized, her remaining eye blazing with fury. She leapt at him with a snarl, and half of the other females followed to help. When they were done, the Cortai would trouble no one else except the cleaning droids. Ima glanced over at Shu, who had watched the massacre with wide eyes. Shortly afterward, they encountered the first squad of guards sent to recapture them. Ima smelled them before she saw them, but when the first Majernham rounded the corner, a pain stick held high in one pincer, it still took them all by surprise. The stick struck Ima across the face and she fell with a shriek of pain, her entire body shaking with convulsions. The insectoid raised the stick to hit another, but Shu leaped in between, taking the blow across her raised upper limb, fighting the betrayal of her own body. Ima was still able to see the crippling blow do little to the human. Shu screeched but didn't fall and her foot snapped out and crushed the joint on the Majernerherm's right foreleg. He tipped, emitting a high-pitched cry, and the human spun. Majernerherm weren't as big as Locale, but they still towered over the little human. It didn't matter as he collapsed and Shu's leg reached as high as her own head in a spinning kick. 
the Mjernerherm's head was torn clean from his shoulders, flying off to bounce against the far wall and putting its blood-resistant coating to the test with a splatter of beige slime. Ima watched as Shu was frozen again by shock at the worst time. The Mjernerherm wasn't alone. Another came up behind and seeing his partner killed so easily, he dropped his pain stick and went for the holster around his thorax. Before any of them could react, he pulled his pulse pistol. Shu stared uncomprehendingly as he aimed and shot her in the chest. The human reeled backwards. Ima had recovered enough to cry out, but the shocked sound was cut off in her throat as Shu recovered her balance. She didn't fall, though by rights her chest should have been a ruin of powdered bone and bruised organs. Not only could she still breathe, but she was snarling. Her teeth bared ferociously as she flung herself at her assailant. The thug was as shocked as any of them, but he aimed the pistol to try again. Shu moved more quickly than she had even in the prison room. She swept within his reach, an open hand parrying the insectoid's extended limb. She swept it down in a circle and her other hand snapped around against the limb's joint. There was a crunch of chitin and the limb was torn away. The pistol still held in the now limp pincer. Shu dropped the severed limb and the Mjernerherm didn't even have time to cry out before her open hand slammed into his thorax, sending him flying backwards. He crashed against the wall and slid to the floor, unmoving. The other three members of the five sapient team, all locale, surged around the corner and halted, aghast at the sight of their two dead team members. Then Shu was leaping at them, and they had no time to think. Shu was becoming deaf to the crack of bone blind to the color of beige or green blood. The group was advancing steadily forward. They'd progressed beyond the labs and were now in what seemed to be office areas. Some of the rooms contained the aliens who looked like the Roswellian Greys, but those aliens had no desire to fight, instead choosing to run or hide. Except for the one alien that the one-eyed raccoon had had a special hate for, the group didn't bother with them. A few of the offices had windows, and Shu now knew they were on a planet a barren planet that looked a lot like a beige version of Mars. She was on an alien planet. It was amazing and momentous, and she desperately wished it was someone else in her place. A soldier, maybe. Or a scientist. They'd met two more groups of soldier aliens, slightly larger groups each time. Their enemies weren't interested in capturing them anymore, as they always opened fire with their energy weapons as soon as they caught sight of them, spitting out bolts of white light. Three of their number had been cut down already, too fatally if she understood the mournful sounds of her partners. It proved her suspicion that the raccoon-like aliens were just as fragile as their captors, or, more accurately, that Shu was as far more durable. Twice Shu had thoughtlessly thrown herself in front of Ima and taken hits that she was sure would have killed her alien friend. The impacts had hurt, like a solid punch, but no worse. When they met such resistance, Ima and the others would fall back and take shelter, and leave Shu to her work. The first encounters had been slaughters, She'd still been frightened and angry, and the insectoid aliens were terrifying. She didn't like bugs, but she still had to defend the others, and so she'd fought desperately. Her form had been horrible. Chifu would have made her clean the guang top to bottom twice if he'd seen it. She hit too hard and barely maintained her balance while kicking. The adrenaline flooding her system had made her sloppy, and in between fights she would shiver as her heart raced. Still, she won. The insectoids were terrifying, their carapaces shiny and hideous, but they cracked like glass beneath her strikes and spewed horrible beige fluids onto her hands and clothes. She already knew the behemoths couldn't take a hit, but every time one of the bug creatures broke underneath her palms it surprised her. One had grabbed her arm and drew back two of his other fists to hit her. She'd countered without thinking, twisting her wrist, and his grabbing arm had splintered, bending where even she knew it wasn't supposed to. Her retaliating palm strike to his chest had produced another popping sound and sent him flying into his squad mates, knocking them down like ten pins. He hadn't gotten back up. Her fright had eventually turned to incredulity, and then a grim inner chill. Shu knew how stupid it was to wish for a fair fight. They were fighting for their lives and freedom. And yet, she didn't feel like a freedom fighter. She felt like an executioner. There was no honor to be had, no sense of accomplishment. She stormed through them as easily as she might have kicked and punched her way through a playground at recess. Shu was forced to revise her earlier revelation. She wasn't merely the alien. She was the alien monster. It wasn't as satisfying as she thought it might be. She allowed herself to ease back, to concentrate on her technique and her breath. She'd been wasting energy, and her shoulders and thighs burned from the exertion. She rested as she could between encounters, saving her strength for when battle was joined, when she would move like the wind and draw fire away from the others. 
She would take a few hits from the energy weapons, but once she jumped and sprinted into the center of the group, they risked hitting each other with every shot. A few of her enemies had drawn glowing swords. Her brother would have been thrilled. He was such a nerd, and nearly sliced her in half. But she dodged the blows and had torn the weapons, and sometimes the hands that held them, from their grips. Rather than pick the swords up herself, she left them for her friends, since for some reason the guns wouldn't work for her. She still had her hands and feet. With her newfound calm, she tried not to kill. She concentrated on her form, her qigong. Her blocks had been sharp and brutal, once even tearing an arm off one of the behemoths. So instead, she tried to use qi sao, guiding their blows around and away. Her strikes could crush an alien chest, so she softened, turning them into powerful shoves. Even the largest of the aliens she could fling across a room, where they'd crash into a wall and fall to the ground, down for the count, but still breathing. She was less careful with the grasshopper aliens, but they triggered every phobia she had and she found it hard to empathize with them. Still, most of them would survive, even if many were lacking limbs when she was done. They were still the bad guys, she reminded herself. When she forced herself to relax, it actually let her move faster and last longer, and her movements confused and frustrated the enemy. It was less effective than the raw terror she'd inspired before, of course, but was also less of a burden on her own spirit. And it was funny watching the behemoths trying to hit her or shoot her when she was in her low stances. They never seemed to think of kicking her. Perhaps being short wasn't all bad. Ima had never thought they'd make it so far. She fought because she had to, led because no one else would. She was lucky that her guesses so far had been accurate. She'd simply thought of how the males on Gao tended to act, concerned about image and power, seeking opulence for themselves and their friends. So she'd simply aimed their group in the direction of the offices with the most decoration, the finest carpets. So far, it seemed to be working. But they'd have been stopped the moment they'd stepped out of the prison wing were it not for the engine of destruction, this human, that they'd allied themselves with. Shu came from a heavy gravity world. Ima was sure of it. It explained her strength and speed. It explained her durability and why she ate so much. Her skeleton and musculature must be far denser than the average sapient. It explained why the floor quivered when she ran, as those long legs hammered against the floor. Vibrations that Ima hadn't noticed in their prison because Shu walked softly, unconsciously hiding her power. By unspoken agreement, they left the bulk of the fighting to the human. Ima had picked up one of the dropped fusion swords, and she and Hamfa and Garun stood guard over the others and the cubs. Only once had they had to cut down an attacking locale. The rest never made it past Shu, who would dash down a hallway and be within melee range before they could react. Ima had heard of tornadoes, though no sensible sapient lived on a world that produced them and Shu was a living version. It was all the more astonishing because Ima recognized the attacks the female used. Although disjointed and out of order, she was unquestionably using the same movements she'd demonstrated in her dancing, applied faster than the eye could follow and with all the strength her compact, powerful body could generate. It should have been comical to see a squad of mercenaries attacked by a little alien half their height and a tenth their bulk, but her hands shattered their limbs, knocking them to the floor. If she was particularly pressed, she would jump, lashing out with her feet in sweeping arcs that crushed skulls. As she watched, Ima could only think of the steady, elegant movements that Shu would practice alongside little Myun. She danced and her enemies died. What kind of creatures were these humans that they made combat, the distribution of injury and death, an elegant, perhaps even beautiful process? The first two squads that tried to stop them were wiped out to the last sapient, blood and gore coating the walls in Shu's clothing. She was a nightmare, a creature from a hollow vid, and though Ima knew they needed her, it was impossible to feel safe in the presence of something that killed so easily. After the second group, though, something changed in the way Shu would fight. Instead of the sharp, deadly movements, the human began concentrating on defense. Once the pulse pistols were torn out of manipulators and tossed away or crushed underfoot, the alien female would slow her pace, going after limbs and legs. At first, Ima thought she was playing with her victims, but it was soon obvious that although she threw mercenaries into walls or each other with force that seemed impossible for such a small body, and the thugs rarely stood up again afterward, they were still breathing. So the humans knew mercy as well. It made Aima feel much better. Gowan females were expected to do whatever was necessary to protect their cubs and each other, and what was necessary could be grim indeed. But they never went that far unless they had to. Were Shu's people the same? The group ended up in front of a pair of large double doors, carved with mechanical precision from the wood of a Cortian sweet tree, and varnished by nanobots with durable diamond coating. Ima knew from her limited readings of interstellar trade that such doors cost enough to supply a colony with a fusion power unit, 
Without a doubt, these were the doors to the administrator of the facility which had trapped them. Her claws slid from their sheaths as her paw gripped her fusion sword tightly. Her clan and their cubs stood behind her, ready. She glanced over at Shu and saw the human watching her, ready to follow her lead. She actually wondered if Shu had the strength to kick in the door as she reached for the trigger pad. Cortai, Gowans, and humans were all similar in height, so the pad was at a comfortable height. She was surprised when the door opened without complaint, and she stepped inside cautiously, her eyes and nose active. She knew someone was inside, but she was still taken by surprise as a six-fingered hand seized the back of her neck and pulled her to the side. The Cortai who had hidden beside the door used his other hand to press a pulse pistol to the side of her muzzle. Shu made an angry noise, lurching forward, but before she could close the distance, another hand from the other side of the door grabbed her lower arm and wrenched her away, hurling her aside with a whine of servos. If Aima needed any confirmation of how heavy Shu was, she got it as the human crashed into a small coffee table in a lounge area to the side of the large office, crushing it beneath her. From beside the door stomped a bulky humanoid figure. The newcomer was shaped like a cortai, but far bulkier and slightly taller. The creature's head was slender and whip-like, looking out of place as it stuck out from between the brawny shoulders. The head had a pair of bulbous eyes and a single horizontal line for a mouth, the corners of which were bent downward in displeasure. Alabenelin, Ima's memory supplied. A worm-like race famous for their prosthetics and avarice, the creature's entire body was synthetic, mechanical, and it gave him the strength to challenge the human. Shu staggered to her feet, breathing heavily, but hesitated as she saw the weapon held to Ima's head. At the door, the other Gowan females did the same, growling and spitting in anger. That will be quite enough of that kind of language, thank you, said the Cortai. And Ima's eyes went wide as she realized he had a translator. I'm quite impressed that you've made it so far, but your little escapade stops here. If you don't wish to meet your ends so much sooner, I'd advise you to put down your weapons and surrender. You expect us to calmly walk back to our cage and await vivisection? Ima snapped but she let the fusion sword drop to the floor, unlit, as he ground the emitter of the pistol against her cheek warningly. Don't be ridiculous. We don't plan to vivisect all of you. Five, maybe six. After that, what more is there to learn? The rest of you will help with viral research, chemical agent testing, and cosmetics. Your contribution to science will be small but important, the Cortai explained calmly. I'm afraid your friend there, however, won't be joining you. Captain Mij here is rather put out about her crippling his mercenary company. His contract didn't include risk provisions. He didn't think they were needed. You know how annelids are. Trig, Midge growled warningly. Why did you take her? Why did you take any of us? Ima demanded. The Cortai, Trig, sighed. You want me to monologue, do you? Fine. I took you all for science. You and your brethren are simply the means to fulfill my main contract. It's just work. Nothing personal until you decided to make it such. The human was for a side project. I'd heard rumors of the species, and they're almost certainly going to end up under a quarantine. So I wished to fetch a specimen before that occurred. Their homeworld is only a small diversion from your colony, so I asked the ship to obtain one. I thought a female would be more docile. Ima couldn't believe what she was hearing. Contracts? Science? Her mouth moved of its own accord. Docile? You really are a bunch of shut-in nerds, aren't you? The pistol pressed more firmly. Mistakes were made, he growled. Such is science. Captain Mij, feel free to fix the mistake. Right, boss, the alabenelin said, stomping forward. Shu had watched uncomprehendingly as they spoke. But as Mij approached her, she lowered her body, extending her hands in front of her as she often would during her dances. Midge swung a cybernetic punch at her, but she pushed it aside, hopping back a step. She hooked one of the low-slung chairs with her foot and flung it at her opponent, who smashed it aside. Trigg sighed again. Preferably without completely destroying my office, Captain. Shu tried not to surrender to panic as she and the weird worm alien traded hits. He was strong, perhaps as strong as she was, and when he managed to hit her, it was as hard as one of their guns. She was quicker and managed to parry most of his blows, guiding them aside and occasionally knocking him off balance. Some of his punches got through, however, and this alien was smart enough to kick when she ducked. She kicked back and hammered his limbs with strikes, but unlike with the other aliens, he did not break under the blows. In fact, he didn't even show any sign of pain. Was he a machine? A cyborg? A month ago, she would have called it science fiction, but she was currently fighting a worm-headed alien on behalf of sapient raccoons on another world, 
so standards had to be relaxed a bit. Her chi sao told her nothing. There was no tensing of muscles before a strike, no relaxation when he would advance or fall back. It was like she was fighting a training dummy, except this dummy hit back, and her bruises and aches were piling up. She'd gradually ramped up the strength of her blows against his limbs, and if she wasn't sure before, she was certain he was a machine now. Metal rang as she kicked his knees and rained elbow strikes on his forearms, blows that could and had dismembered opponents at the start of their sudden insurrection. She'd bitterly come to the conclusion that he was too strong to hold back, and she'd best be prepared to kill again, cursing in her own mind for jinxing herself by complaining about the weakness of her previous foes. But the only fleshy part of him was his worm-like head. Her stomach queezed at the thought of even touching it, and despite how much faster she seemed to be compared to everyone else, he was still too quick in pulling his head in like a turtle whenever she managed to leap high enough to grab at it. Her tries were rewarded with punches to the gut or chest, and once even succeeded in knocking her down. What could she do? She wished she'd paid better attention to Sifu. She'd only ever expected to use her martial arts on the screen or maybe at a forms competition. She never expected she'd ever have to actually fight. What would Shifu say? She struggled to think. Well, probably the first thing he would say was that to keep trying, what didn't work, wasn't Bagua. Continue the circle. Try another direction. Adapt. But how could she adapt to fighting an enemy who was all machine? Except... He wasn't all machine, was he? He breathed. She could hear it. His head was like a worm. Was the rest of him worm-like as well? Was he a tube of flesh in a metal human-like body? Ew. Gross. But it gave her an idea. She leaped back, out of his range, catching her breath. On a passing whim, she made her return to a fighting stance fancy and elaborate. It seemed to confuse him a little, and it raised her spirits a bit. I'm ready for my scene, Mr. Wong. The human female had been fighting Mij the way she'd fought most of the guards and thugs who had blocked their way, with mercy, striking at limbs to debilitate rather than kill. But the Annelid had no limbs. His body was a mechanical suit, a vehicle that he rode within. She was wasting her strength. Her blows made the room ring loud enough to make Trigg flinch but didn't do much. Ima couldn't even tell her. Even if Trigg would allow her to shout advice, Shu couldn't understand what she was saying. But Shu was clever, possibly even as clever as a Gowan or Kortai. Aima could tell when the human had realized. As she'd watched, she saw the character of Shu's blows change, if only slightly. They seemed to stick a bit longer, as if they were not just hits but shoves as well. Her body motion became even more dance-like, circling Mij in his cybernetic suit, hammering him from all sides and flowing around his counters like water. The alabenolin was knocked backwards bit by bit until he had to brace against the wall just to protect his rear. Shu stopped circling and continued to punish his body, the most armored part of his suit. But was Mij panting? It was inevitable in any martial art, especially in one known to be lethal like Ba Gua Zhang, that a student would ask about Dim Mak, or the death touch. Shifu handled the oft-repeated question with far more patience than Shu would have, after so many repetitions. No, the death touch didn't exist, he said, except in fantasy and in pure raw luck and accident but that didn't mean that the basic concept was useless. Attack the center line, he said. Send your force through the flesh and disrupt the chi inside. Shu wasn't sure how seriously she'd taken that aspect of her training, but she applied it against Mij with desperation turned to determination. She stopped trying to damage his limbs and only worried about parrying his hits. When she struck back, it was against his center line. That was one thing about all these aliens. They did a shoddy job of defending their bodies. He would try to hit her and she'd guide the blow aside with Bei Shen Zhang or some other rolling movement, trying to conserve her energy until she could lash back with either a palm or a fist, drilling into his center with all the power she could muster. Being so close, he naturally tried to kick her away, but whenever he tried, she would hook his foot with her own, stretching him out and knocking him off balance until he gave up trying. She slammed her hand again and again against where the solar plexus would be on a human, or the midpoint of a spine. She walked the circle around him and had... She walked the circle around him, and he had problems keeping up, Eventually, he had to back against a wall just to keep her from getting behind him, so she punished his front, and the reinforced wall he was pressed against actually began to crumple slightly. It was working! The worm-like alien actually had paled, and though it was weird to see a worm with a mouth, she could tell he was struggling for breath. He was flesh inside the suit, just very long and narrow. He was as fragile as any of the other aliens, and her attacks were knocking him around inside. Chifu would be so proud. Midj, what is the matter with you? Trigg snapped. In front of him, his pulse pistol still to her head, Ima grinned feirally. The administrator had been smug through most of the short and vicious fight, 
But then Shu had suddenly gained a second wind. The others, still huddled in a crowd at the entrance to the room, had been watching the battle with nervousness and then elation, as if the underdog team had suddenly turned a sporting event around, rather than the ultimate fate of their lives. Their cheers had only enraged the Kortai administrator even further. Midge, finish it! Midge! Trigg snapped. By the stars! Trigg moved the pulse pistol away from her head, aiming at Shu, thinking to rescue his beleaguered henchman. It was the moment Ima had been waiting for. Her claws unsheathed and she lashed out at his extended arm. Gowan claws were relatively tiny, but they traced a trio of furrows down his arm, which immediately leaked blue liquid. The Kortai cried out and then snarled, trying to bring the pistol back to shoot her, but she seized his arm and struggled. The others, almost not believing what they were seeing, hesitated before surging forward. Trigg managed to shove her off, knocking her down. He saw the angry crowd rushing him and fired randomly into it, and Ima heard cries of pain. He looked back at her and she saw murderous fury there. The pulse pistol swung back to aim at her head. A fleshy rope lashed out, catching him in the wrist. The pulse pistol was sent flying, and Trigg cried out in agony and fell to his knees, clutching at his arm. Ima looked up and saw Shu standing there, looking as angry as when little Myun had been threatened. Clutched in her hand was Midge himself without his power armor. She'd managed to grab hold of him, ripping him out of his suit and then using him as a living whip to strike down his boss. The analid gurgled in her grip, struggling for breath, the long coil of his body flopping uselessly against the floor. Ima struggled to her feet. She glared down at the sniveling Kortai. We win. Trigg initially didn't want to cooperate. That was easily solved. Shu simply took hold of his good wrist and squeezed until the researcher was quite agreeable. She hadn't even needed to be asked, easily interpreting the argument between the administrator and Ima. After that, Trigg was only too happy to send a distress signal on their behalf. Nearly twenty of their captors were shepherded into the holding area where the subjects had been kept stripped of their weapons and given medical supplies to treat each other, since their former lab subjects lacked the know-how. Outside the cage stood three angry Gowan females armed with fusion swords and the implied assistance of their human ally. Mij was locked in a tank with an air-permeable lid found in one of the labs, good enough to keep the worm from somehow wiggling out and trying to get back to his armor. Trigg was allowed to treat his broken wrist, though with Shu's digits poised at the back of his neck. The Kortai was smart enough to know that anything untoward would result in his head impacting into and knowing the human strength through his fine, impeccable quality desk. The Gowans questioned him the entire time. Aima was disappointed to learn that even the translator didn't have Shu's language programmed into it. In fact, the installation database didn't even have the name of her homeworld, nor its location. Trigg had been careful about hiding his steps and preserving his plausible deniability. The location had been supplied only to the ship's crew, and they were long gone. Shu was alone, and Aima wondered if she understood that. One planetary rotation after their successful escape and seizure of the installation, they received a response to their distress call. Even better, it was a Gowan ship. It was good news and drew cheers even as they mourned the loss of Hamfa, Ujali, and Minin. The captain of the ship was appalled by the deaths of the three females, and Aima appreciated the fact that he seemed quite sincere, not merely acting for the sake of improving his mating prospects. The ten surviving females and four cubs were given births, while Trigg was shoved into the brig. The installation's distress call was left running, as they would be leaving the prisoners and Mij for someone else to deal with. If no one came, well, Ima didn't care. The ship's crew were professional and efficient. The one hiccup came when it came to decide what to do with Shu. She isn't Gowan, mistress, the captain protested. She's alien! She consumes nearly four times as much oxygen as one of us, and if her appetite is as you say... You're heading straight to the homeworld, aren't you? She demanded. You said what? A five-rotation journey? Surely we wouldn't deplete your consumables that quickly. Yes, I mean, no, but... What about other concerns? Alien beings, particularly from uncontacted worlds, carry unknown diseases. And if she's as violent as you've reported... She was violent in our defense, Captain! She snapped. If you don't threaten us or the children, I think you'll find her quite agreeable. As for disease, she was implanted with the Kortai long-term suppressor. We all were. We'll just leave hers in place until we're certain, distasteful though it may be. The captain was wilting, watching his hopes for enticing her as a mating partner dwindle as he argued. Why would you concern yourself for an alien female? She isn't clan! Ima looked over at where Shu sat in the corner of the docking bay. Two of the cubs scrambled all over her, but she held them up as easily as if they were made of soft pillows. Myun hung from her outstretched arm, chittering with Gowan laughter. 
and Shu responded with her own barking version of the same. The human could literally tear some of the fiercest mercenaries in existence limb from limb. Yet Aima had no fear for the little cub as Shu bounced her lightly. The human had proven she knew how and when to use her strength. You're wrong, Captain, Aima answered. She is clan, and we don't leave clan behind. <laughs>